Okay, welcome everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure and a great honor to announce this um, lecture by um, Peter Minang and Mein von Nordwig. Um, it is, it, it's also a pleasure because I myself have been associated to ICRAF in Indonesia for quite a while and I'm happy to see familiar faces coming back to, to Bonn. Um, Peter is a senior scientist at the, and global coordinator of the ASB program. There's a, there's a poster, uh, so you know what ASB stands for. Uh, for the tropical forest margins at the World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi. He's a geographer, and his research interests are on reducing emissions from all land use and red plus. Also, he serves various advisory roles on climate change for African governments and uh, regional bodies and organizations. Um, let me introduce to you the, the second speaker of today, which is uh, Mein van Norkvik. He is a, the, the chief science advisor of the, for the World Agroforestry Center, ICRAF, in Indonesia, Southeast Asia. And he uh, wrote a lot of books and publications, which is impossible to list now. Yeah. <laughs> so, let me not talk too long and welcome both of you uh, for a lecture called... Uh, sparing versus sharing, addressing the drivers of deforestation uh, and forest degradation. And the format of the lecture will be that uh, Peter will talk to us 15 to 20 minutes, after that minor, and then we can all get involved in the discussion. Please, the floor is yours, Peter. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I hope, uh, we, just to explain to you, afternoon everyone, um, we round three, because we started in Cancun, in Mexico, with the first round of this kind of discussion and debate, and then we did the second round yesterday at the UNFCC SAPSTA meetings, and today is round three of the sharing versus sparing debate. So... My job this morning would be to sort of argue for why we need sparing, you know, and uh, Maya will come up and talk about why we might need uh, sharing, and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll have some discussions about you know, whether or not we need any of them at all. Um, so. Just to go, I mean, just to introduce to you, I mean, the basic question that we're trying to look at is why, why do we talk about sparing and sharing in the, this whole discussions about agriculture and reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation? So the basic question that we try to answer is, you know, things that demand this sort of questioning is that there is increased demand for food, fiber, and fuel. And the population is increasing, as a, you know, because uh, and that is driving that need. So because of that, more land is being cleared, forest land is being cleared for agriculture. Now, um, there's one study by Gibbs. Um, I didn't put the reference there. Eighty percent of all farm establishments between 1980s and 1990s in developing countries came from intact forests. That's a study that that uh, that was. Uh, and not only that, but the most, I think, important bit of that clearing is that the 80% the establishment comes with three to four times more greenhouse gas emissions than in temperate areas from a land perspective. Yeah? And so then, because of that, then people go back to what, what can we do about that? And then it falls back to the whole intensification debate, which is basically about can intensification spare forest, you know, forever, basically. Um, which is branded the Bullock hypothesis. Within that, um, it basically says if we increase the yield per unit area, 
then people would require less land to produce, and so they won't clear the forest anymore. This is the basic logic. So we can have more forest conserved, we can have more forest within the red debate. But this graph from Rudel, it always will show you that for that to happen, these three conditions must come together. So we talk about the yield that should increase with time, but on the other side, on the other hand, you would, should have the cultivated, the cultivated area should reduce as a consequence. But in, in the real situation in economics, it will not be working without you having the prices also reducing as a result. And we will we'll come to that a little um, later. Now, the question is, how true has that been? That's the big question that people ask. Well, some analysis by Rudel, again, shows that in, from FAO data between 1990 and 2005, 1970 and 2005, FAO data shows that it's only within a five-year period in history, between 1980 and 1985, that we've been able to have these three conditions that we saw in the graph happening at the same time. Where you've had yield increase, the cultiv total cultivated area reduced, and where prices have gone down. Now, so in essence, within that 20 year, 25 year period, we haven't had any strong evidence that you know that is possible basically that's the argument that is being made and so eventually you see there are two pathways through which this can can happen if you increase yields theoretically and the demand remains the uh, demand is you know inelastic then you might have lower prices and then the areas might drop in economic terms. The second scenario is if your yields increase and the demand is elastic, what will happen is that the prices will go up to meet the demand and then people would go to clear more land because it's more profitable, you know, and so you will have more increase in areas cultivated. Yeah? Now, the big question is, so this is that evidence that I talked about in terms of, if you look at the mapping here, only in this span have we had the graph going up for yields and the prices and the cultivated areas going down. Now, one explanation they gave for that is that within in the in the um, in the late 70s there were there were more there was more put into investment into these kinds of intensification um, dynamics in terms of technological innovation in terms of investment but it's still not very clear whether or not that was responsible. So my job this afternoon is to say, okay, some of the evidence says yes, we, we haven't seen that happen. Theoretically, it should work. Why not? Because the logic is very clear if you reduce, if you increase your yield within your production areas, then you don't need more land to produce more food for the people that need it. That logic is very clear. But why is it not, not happening? I, I think that um, this is still a bit some more evidence in that, but you know, there are regional things, as you see, that in Africa it's not changed at all. Basically, there is still a lot of you know, agricultural extensification to meet the area, area needs the needs for the demand for food, fuel, and things like that. So, 
The argument that we want to put is, number one, I think that the intensification hypothesis in theory should work. But we just have a greedy world where people demand more and more and more and more every day. And so we are not able to meet our demands because we are basically asking for too much from scarce land. Now there is, if you look at, there is, a, there is some research that was published reviewing how much land do we need and how much land do we have based on the demands for fuel and things like that. What you find is that, uh, I think that was done by uh, Lambert from one of our projects, the Red Alert project. And it says that if you, if you take the demand for land that we, from all of the different land demands, and you look at how much land is available and arable in the world, then we are basically in a situation where between 2020 and 2050, all of arable land will be exhausted. Between 2020 and 2050. Any time around then, all arable land will be exhausted. So the whole question is, the, if you want to look at sparing, it's addressing the supply side of the equation, which is fine. But the demand side of the equation, which is us, is not changing. And I think that will get worse when with our new demands for biofuels and things like that, because that's a new demand that is not sufficiently factored in all the land demand and supply analysis that we have at the moment. So the big question is, from a supply perspective independently, intensification should work. But it only stops, it's only halted by demand that we are not addressing because no one is addressing the demand side of, of the equation effectively. And, 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 and then you see exactly what, what I'm talking about. Now, this same analysis by Lambert and Mefroy actually did analysis for a number of countries around the world. I think about 12 or, or 16. Now you find that about six of them show you that it is possible some countries have been able to simultaneously increase forest cover, you know, and increase agricultural productivity at the same time, and the areas where they, 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 they produce. But the big question is, you know, that is done within the country. But again, the demand side blocks the whole the niceness of the achievements of intensification within the country. In the sense that, people now argue that they were only able to do that because they displaced their demand, you know, they imported more to replace what they were supposed to be producing within the country. Yeah? So, so the, if that evidence is trying to tell you, okay, well, they could only do that because they were importing more from Laos and Cambodia, you know, and, 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 and these other parts. Because you have countries like Vietnam, you know, you have uh, 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 um, China, and some people are saying they mainly exported that to Laos and Cambodia and other neighboring countries, importing their wood from there, importing some food stuff from there. That's why they are able to to achieve, achieve this. But to me, it seems to me like that's a completely different part of the equation. In practical terms, they were able to achieve, you know, within the same setting, you know, that kind of thing. The second argument that I think um, makes the argument against intensif intensification not so convincing to me is the fact that intensification we have not invested sufficiently to see whether it works or not. You know, we, we, we say we should intensify. In many instances, we say it doesn't work, you know, for some countries. But if all countries invested sufficiently in intensification, we might solve the food problems, you know, from a global, a global perspective and not have to worry about moving food from one place to the other. 
And so the displacement issue will be offset, you know, and, and we might have less traffic. And just to illustrate that, if you look at this data from the World Development Report of 2008, you see that all spending on agriculture, innovation, technologies, development has significantly reduced in countries that are meant to be agriculture-based economies. Yeah? A lot of that has shifted to what, you, what is now branded rural poverty, which is not necessarily agriculture. Now, even the countries that are supposed to be agriculture-based countries spend significantly less money, you know, in agricultural research in the countries. And so, how can you claim that you, you, you blame intensification for not succeeding when you actually don't do what you are required to do in terms of input investment, in terms of technological investment, in terms of investment in policies, and then you say intensification doesn't work. It should work if you do it rightly, you know, in places like, you know, Vietnam where they've done it rightly, it should work. The whole question is, well, okay, you, how do you address, you know, the, the... And this chart shows you again a bit of that dynamic. In Africa where you've had productivity, production growing by an area index, you know, rather than, you know, in Asia where you have more a yield index in terms of productivity. So you increase production in sub-Saharan Africa basically by extensification, more area cultivated, and in Asia with better investment in, 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 in agriculture, you know, then you have a bit more, more from the yield side of the story. Yeah? The, but then we come back again, we'll come back to the Asian side of the story. The, the next argument that I have is having part of the reason why everyone blames and says intensification doesn't work is because of how we've defined intensification. Yeah? Now, technically there should be like, in literature you see about three ways of looking at intensification. Yeah? Either you say intensification is increasing yield per hectare based on inputs, which is, this is the classic definition of intensification that is applied at the moment. Yeah? But alternative two is that you increase your cropping intensity. Yeah? Which of them are we currently talking about in intensification? The third one is changing land use from low value crops or commodities to high value market price commodities. That's a third perspective of intensification. Yeah? At the moment, all of what we talk about in intensification, 90%, 95% refers to the first one. Yeah? So, suppose you talk about a case study that I'm going to talk about in, in Jambi, in Indonesia, where that has moved more to this dimension, but in real terms, it's still very high value, high carbon stocks, landscapes, better economics, you know. So all our critique of intensification is because we see it from this lens. We don't see it from this lens and we don't see it from this lens. Agroforestry has part of this lens, you know, and has part of this lens, as opposed only to cereals that we refer to in the intensification debate and the literature, that's largely what you get in the intensification debate. Yeah? Now, so if you look at the case of Jambi, for example, where you've had, you had this history of migration moving from Java into, into Sumatra, into Jambi area, and with more dominated by smallholder farmers, you know, with, within this resettlement schemes, deforestation became a bit more accelerated at the initial time of, of, of settlement, yeah? And then with years of growth, you know, 
and, and this farming system is developing, you now have a scenario in which a lot of absentee landlords and urban investors are going back and investing in in small hold, in, 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 in smallholder semi industrial plantation you know uh, crop systems yeah now this was also accelerated in 1997 with the currency collapse where people started seeing land as a more secure you know way of keeping their, their resources and so investments in land became a bigger thing for people going back and investing in, in land in these areas. That's the evidence that came from the ASB report. And you can see from this graph that you have these maps that in the 1990s you had a dominant scenario where you had lighter areas, more light areas, more logging, more clearing, lighter um, you know, systems with less relatively low carbon, you know, uh, low economic value land. But from 2000 and beyond, then you started having more tree crops, you know, with the loss of forest being replaced by much, much dense carbon stock systems, agroforestry systems that are both high carbon stocks and also high value economic stocks. The, the, uh, value. The, the question is, is that intensification or not? Yeah? Do you report this as intensification or we don't report this as intensification? If this is seen as intensification, then we would say intensification has worked. Because this, this will be what you expect. The values here, biodiversity values, will not significantly drop, you know, the carbon, the biodiversity relative difference to crop farm, plant, farms will be, you know, not, not very bad with these intermediate land uses. So, we need to rethink why, how, when we blame intensification, we say intensification doesn't work, then we think about all of these different things that we are not able to clarify and to answer. I think the third, the, 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 the fourth, probably fourth part of my argument with respect to why we cannot conclude that intensification doesn't uh, 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 save forest is that we, we clearly don't know what is forest and what is not forest. We cannot draw a line between what is a forest and what is not a forest. Currently within the UNFCC debate, you know, there are these arguments whether or not 10% forest, 10% tree cover is a forest or is not a forest. You know, and, 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 and that reflects in a bit in, in some of the things that you see in Cameroon. Some people will take this part of the country, northern part, which is Sahelian and semi arid. When they take 10% of the forest cover on this part, and compute that against a humid, dense Congo Basin rainforest and take an average of deforestation rate, you know, then you get a deforestation rate, the FAO type deforestation rate. When you use basically the same definition within this humid forest Congo Basin area, you get a deforestation rate like this one within the same country this is the same period almost but look at the difference in assessment of deforestation rates so what are we basing it on if we go back and we take the forestry the agroforestry tree systems that were marked in jambi and we use that if we apply that here then we get a completely different rate, some rate in between. Yeah, so the whole question is, do we know where we stop with deforestation, what we call forest and what we don't call forest? Until we define that, then we don't know exactly whether or not intensification saves forest or it doesn't save forest. I think so, 
My conclusion would be, I think, intensification of agriculture is a necessary condition for forest protection. Unless mine argues the contrary. But. Can I ask Peter a question before we go on? You can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we need to go back to your slide, the one yeah. with yields, crop area, and prices. Okay, yeah. Can you, can you still okay. go back to that? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Okay. Because that tells the whole story. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Now the Borlaug hypothesis mm -hmm. is 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 all about the interaction of yield cultivated areas and prices. Yeah. Yeah. And if in fact um, yields were not increasing the way they are shown in this graph, mm -hmm. how would you expect prices to go? The prices would not have declined like this, mm -hmm. they would have continued to go up. To go on. Yeah. And no. higher prices would be the reason that land values would increase and it would stimulate mm. deforestation. Mm. That's, mm. The, that's the direct connection. Mm. And in fact, uh, you, you were saying that only during the early 80s mm. does the actual results tend to support, support. the hypothesis. Yeah. But I, I think they support the hypothesis through the entire period mm. of time because after all, what you're seeing here is that cultivated area actually fell back the amount of land fell back. Why? Because prices were declining. Yeah. 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 But it, it was actually less than the cultivated area mm -hmm. in 1980 mm -hmm. all the way up to 2005 Fine. Mm -hmm. for 20 yeah. more years yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. until overall demand caused mm -hmm. um, the, 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 uh, the need for um, full, full production to come back, mm -hmm. even though prices mm -hmm. were very low. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, so I think the interplay of these factors show exactly what the Borlaug hypothesis was trying to say. Because if, if you have to use a, uh, uh, an analysis of what would have happened uh, as the counterfactual, right? Okay. Yeah. If, if, if yields had not gone up and prices had not gone down, how would you expect crop area to have gone? Crop area would have kept on going up. Yeah. That that's that's pretty that's pretty concrete, and that's what that's what the Borlaug hypothesis is all about. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it didn't increase simply was due to the fact that intensification reduced prices and dampened the uh, demand for land. Mm -hmm. But if yields hadn't increased and prices went down, mm -hmm. the crop area would have increased and deforestation would have been even uh, mm -hmm. even 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 more stimulating. So I, I think the model should. There's there's other literature. So now we have two proponents for. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, are you really a proponent? Because he's on the other side. Uh, he's on the other side. Yeah. Oh, he's on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But but you have to model the counterfactual of what would have happened if this all yeah. hadn't yeah. occurred. You know. Yeah. Uh, that is, if there hadn't been an increase in yields and a decrease in prices. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think it's it's pretty pretty solid there. Let's see the other side of the story. Well, pretending that we completely disagree, <laughs> I'd like to take the arguments on the what we is usually seen as the other side of the story, the land sharing, and and if land sparing is one version, we spare, we intensify agriculture here, so we'll have land left for forest, and we'll have forest and nature here and we have intensive agriculture there and that is the best way to solve the world and that's the best way to reduce carbon emissions in the context of current climate debate. The counter argument to that is that it is not about sparing, it is about sharing. And, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give a few more questions on what are challenges that we have with the sparing hypothesis and then try to make a point that sharing is at least worthwhile to consider. If we simplify the land sparing in terms and, and say, well, higher yields per hectare mean less land is needed for agriculture and that means saving the forest, if that's the simple version of it, we have a couple of problems. Yeah? Of course, in terms of emissions, uh, agricultural intensification itself is a cause of emission. Yeah? 
the agricultural intensification, the way we've seen it here in Western Europe, has mostly been about removing trees from the landscape and getting larger fields so that tractors can work and plow and this and that. And we have meant by intensification that we've cleared a lot of trees out of that agriculture landscape causing emissions. And at the same time, the emissions from nitrous oxide, N2O, are quite substantial. Yeah. And if we need a lot of fertilizer to intensify and we have fertilizer efficiencies as low as they normally are, and it's common that only 30% of the fertilizer gets taken up by the crop and two-thirds get lost, and a substantial part of that goes off as N2O. And you probably know the greenhouse gas effect per molecule of N2O is 250 times the greenhouse gas effect of one molecule of CO2. So if we intensify by using fertilizer, we're not actually saving the climate, we're actually, uh, in, may, in, in some cases, increase the emissions. Another, so we need to make sure that we do the accounting properly and we need the accounting across all greenhouse gases before we can say that intensifying agriculture would actually lead to emission reduction by saving the forest. Another, and Peter alluded to that, there is, of course, yeah, there are multiple ways of defining intensification and there is one version that talks about the input and intensifying means using more input. There's another version that defines intensification based on the output. Now, if you say intensification is about increasing the yield per area, then of course there is a very simple equation that yield means area times yield per unit area. Mm. That's not a hypothesis, that's a truism, that's a simple equation. You can cancel out area and you see yield is yield. But is it a truism? Is it so that returns to land, if we say that as yield per, per hectare, actually are related to area expansion? Well, the jury is out and, and by and large it, it, it is not as simple as that. Maybe there are places in the world which look like that. And I had the pleasure to be in one of those places two weeks ago. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea is a place where an economy works without market. It is one of the few countries in the world that still fully believes in planned economies and where how much land is needed for agriculture is calculated by the National Planning Agency and then implemented. Now this is an interesting map of Korea Peninsula which is the urban lights that are seen from satellite imagery. Uh, this is the Korean Peninsula. You see that they have done a split pot experiment there in the 1950s and South Korea has all these urban lights at night and North Korea has basically one little spot in Pyongyang in the capital. Yeah. So that's a country where indeed that equation, the Borlaug hypothesis, would fully work. That if we have a planned economy and we calculate how much rice we need for our people and how much area we need, and higher yields per hectare means less area and, and that, that's that's how it works. There's a, no, no space in that country for farmer initiative whatsoever. And there, the intensification hypothesis might work in its simple story. But most of the parts that we work on are much more open economies. Uh, Peter alluded to the elasticity. And higher yields per hectare in an open system may not lead to saving the forest. They may lead to even more people coming in. Yeah. And the early version of the ASB findings in different countries showed that the, yeah, the profitable versions of coffee farming and rubber farming that replaced dependency on food crops in much of Indonesia actually attracted more and more people to come there and grow more coffee and grow more rubber. Yeah. And basically there's only two options. Either intensification works and it is profitable and then it suffers from its own success because it is profitable it would attract more people to come there and still clear the forest because they now have a more profitable way of clearing the forest or it does not work, it is not profitable and then we're spending public money on subsidizing things that don't quite work and the question is wouldn't there be better ways of using that money yeah. so where intensification sometimes it is economically viable, sometimes it is not we can argue that if it is a success, then 
the success eats up its own success because in terms of forest protection because it would attract more people. In places like Indonesia where we have huge pools of people in neighboring islands ready to move anywhere where identification is successful, that would wipe out any potential benefits for the forest that we might have. Yeah, so our version of the agricultural intensification hypothesis, which, which ASB program started in the Borlaug hypothesis, was that indeed if we have three classes of land, we have forest, we have low intensity agriculture, high intensity agriculture, intensification would create more space for the forest. But we've actually seen that more intensive agriculture eats up the forest even faster. Yeah? And the basic assumption of a closed economy doesn't work. Peter did allude to something that we have here in that, of course, another problem with the hypothesis is that it talks about saving the forest, and we have no idea what forest means. Now, Peter showed a graph of Cameroon with different deforestation rates. They're partly based on different data sets for the same country. These are all data come from the same data set. They come from the same satellite imagery, interpreted in exactly the same way. But we use different concepts of forest. Now, there are two lines here, a blue line and a red line. If the red line is higher than the blue, then the deforestation rate is going up. If the blue line is higher than the red, then the deforestation rates are going down. With that same data, I can show you that Cameroon deforestation rate was all between 0 and 1% per year. Mm -hmm. Indonesia deforestation rate was already extremely high, 3.5% per year, and it went up to even 5.5% per year after 2000. But a slightly different interpretation of the word forest, and I see that the deforestation rate was only 1% and it dropped down to 0. Now what are these different concepts? This is the high deforestation rate is the forest concept that the Rainforest Foundation would use. We talk about untouched natural forest as the forest. And we talk about anything dealing with that as deforestation. The low deforestation rates applies the UNFCCC forest definition, 30% tree cover, yeah, and temporarily unstocked even, yeah, if you want. And it shows that actually deforestation rate, there is no deforestation in Indonesia. What are we talking about? Yeah? And after 2000, we already solved the problem because the deforestation rate became zero. Now what happened was we replaced that natural forest with a monoculture plantation of Acacia mangium, Elias guineensis. Now, there is some debate on, on whether Elias guineensis, more popular known as the oil palm, whether that's a tree, yes or no, and in consequence, whether the plantation of those trees can be called a forest. Now, if those are Acacia mangium, and there is no debate in any forester's mind that the planted forest is a forest. If there are planted oil palm trees, then there is a debate whether or not you can call that a forest, yes or no. But basically, you see this replacement of natural forest by planted trees simply because they're more profitable. And we see no evidence at all that the sparing hypothesis has worked. Yeah, so in summary, uh, land sparing, we, we can see does it save the forest? Well, no. Um, definitely not in an automatic way uh, and not without caring for that forest, without active protection it wouldn't work and it may be a, a necessary condition as Peter said it definitely is not a sufficient condition it is not that intensifying agriculture by itself would save the forest and would be lead to reducing emissions and we see that actually intensification can also be based on, on using working trees and, and useful trees within a landscape and, and reducing emissions per unit product. And that's a very different type of intensification. Which actually leads you to, to the point that trees actually are and still are an important part of most agricultural landscapes. This is the map of the world as foresters would see it. Within what FAO maps as forest lands of the world, we have differences in tree density, with places old forest with less than 10% tree cover, with between 10 and 30, 30 to 60, more than 60. We see all shades of green within the forest. This is the agroforestry part of the world. In the complement, what we see as agriculture land, we have three cover, tree densities from 0 to 10, from 10 to 30, 30 to 60, and 60 and more. And if we combine 
then we see all the tree-covered world, both in the forest and outside the forest, and we see that the same legend works in both cases. Now, uh, some of you may have seen the job, but of course 5% of the males don't see difference between red and green. And they are right. <laughs> yeah. Um, in this case, it is, if you're interested in emissions, we should look at tree cover and not bother about constitutional definitions of forest. And tree cover is an important part of agriculture yeah, and should be seen in that. Yeah. If I take you to a landscape in Sumatra, I, you, you, there is open field rice fields, there is trees in the rice fields, there is a home garden, there is an agroforest with rubber and some orangutans and some other trees coming in and we climb up and we get natural forest out here. Where does the forest end? Where does the forest start? Is this a forest? Is this a forest? Is that a forest? These are the home gardens, the coconuts and the fruit trees. This is the Kaminyan, the dom locally domesticated timber tree for resin. This is in the natural forest. Yeah. The concept of forest is not a meaningful entity. So if we say intensification saves the forest, we need to be much more clear what forest means. The counterpart, land sharing, is actually looking for a high overall functionality of land and not caring about agricultural production per se, but we should look at maximizing the total functionality of land. And we can actually see that a multifunctionality combining functions is in general more efficient than separating out this is for agriculture and that is for the forest and the biodiversity. And we see over time, of course, we have forest transition, we see there's logically temporal connections between what happens in most landscapes with natural forest decreasing a degraded land phase and a recovery of trees in in yeah. We can see this as a description of time, we can see this as a description of space. But the main problem is the institutional divide, that a lot of that land without trees is still called forest. And it is managed as if it is a forest, and people don't allow farmers or anyone to come in there with a logical combination of trees and agriculture that would work. Yeah? And when we describe intensification, we may see wilderness as the least intensive and intensive stuff here. Yeah. The problem is that the term forest is used both for wilderness as well as for very intensive plantation for pulp and paper and other wood. And saving the forest is a meaningless concept unless we have different words for these different types of forest. And we'll see here if we look at population density versus not only the amount of forest but what type of forest you get. You get every population density has its own type of trees and has its own things. And whatever you want to call forest is forest. Is that to you? So the first big argument for sharing is there simply isn't enough land to do one function here, one function there. Yeah. When people calculate footprints, if we look at the totality of current, current demand for food, current demand for firewood, current demand for carbon sequestration, and we add it up and we see what is the ecological footprint of humanity at the current level, suddenly 2.2 hectare per person. The land available is 1.8 hectare per person, so our footprint is already bigger than the planet. That is, in calculations where we take every function needs its own land and we add it all up and we say, and that's why we have global warming, because we don't have enough land to sequester the carbon that's calculated to be needed in this type of thing. Now, this is a supply and a demand side of it. What is the ways to get it working? Well, keeping less people, that's less people, Oh, talk to the Pope. Keep the people poor, make sure they don't consume as much. Well, not quite acceptable. The only way to deal with it is footprint intensity and making sure that we consume more of the stuff that has a lower intensity. On the supply side, what can we do? Total area? Well, we have limits on that. It really is about the bioproductivity. It's about, yeah, but that's where the multifunctionality comes in. Now, Many of you may know the old intercropping literature. Is it useful to have two crops sharing the same land, yes or no? Well, it all depends on the type of trade-off curve that you get. If you get more of function one and you get more of function two, the trade-off curve can be a straight line and then it doesn't matter which one you choose. The trade-off curve can be 
a concave curve that you lose out a lot of function 2 before you actually gain on function 1. And the Taylor curve can be a convex one that you can actually meaningfully combine two functions and get a benefit from that. Now, our sharing argument is that actually there are a lot of functions where the Taylor curve is, is convex. And there's a lot of opportunity for multifunctionality and we should make maximum use of that. The other forestry literature is full of that. So we need empirical data about what are these trade-offs. Now that is one of them, for example, carbon stock versus biodiversity. And we see that yes, uh, there is, it's not the one-on-one -on -one line, there is an intercept out here, but we also see evidence of hysteresis that the degradation line is different from the recovery line. We make a, a, a big step and we look at all these possible trade-off curves between all possible functions, so crop production, tree production, carbon storage, watershed function, this and that. And we see which of these pairs are likely to be convex, which are likely to be concave, which would likely to be neutral. We see there is probably more purple in this graph than there is yellow. The yellow ones are the ones where multifunctionality is not a good idea and generally food crops are not very compatible with dark shades and, and carbon stocks, but most other functions have a lot more complementarity. And there's a lot more space for sharing functions. And there's a lot more space for multifunctionality than the sparing hypothesis presented. Yet, we have some challenges as well, that even if we would say that these straight rate of curves, we differ from a straight line, and there is a space, there is an economic optimum phase where a combination of functions could work. The problem is that if one function has a higher economic value than the other, uh, farmers would still be tempted to simplify their rubber agroforest and make it a rubber monoculture, etc. And unless we, in this shape, that's a bit more technical, but if we put values on carbon, we can see that without the carbon value, the shape would be like this, with the carbon value, the shape would be like that. And we can see what type of carbon value would be needed to make it the, the private interest coincide with the social interest. The Diversitas group has looked a lot at these trade-off curves in, in large systems, agricultural systems. So what is the agriculture productivity, what is the biodiversity ecosystem services? Of course, we would like to be in this part of the graph, high carbon stocks and high productivity. Well, no one has been there yet. And we see a dominant negative trade-off curve. We see at the same time a lot of land that is down here, that is low in both terms and space for recovery. And yet we see this part of the graph is possible. We don't have to be on this line. There is a potential to be in this part of the graph, to be um, yeah, lose less, lose less versions of it and get a lot better. So we have this acronym sweet or sour. What we need is sweet, is the sustainable weighting of this ecology economy trade-off. And we may get, if we intensify, we may get to this point that we, for small additional gains in productivity, we lose out a lot of the environmental services and we're stretching our resources. Yeah? So this intensification has some meaning, different meaning in this part of the curve than it has in this part of the curve. We need the sustainable weighting. How do we get economic trade-offs into the system? Well, the simple language is payment for ecosystem services. Once one buyer and one provider and they make the contract, well, we worked on that a lot and it is not as simple as that. There are these four major groups. There is the landscapes in which services are produced. There are the citizens, citizens customers, <laughs> the potential buyers. But of course, there's an equally important government role. There's an equally important private sector role. And it is a four-actor game rather than a two-actor game. And as is the way too simple as a language. And we need to understand how governments regulate what people can do and how regu governments regulate what private sector can do. Yeah. So uh, we worked on these, what it takes in reality, but if, in the RUPES program in Asia and the PRESA project in Africa, we have to give details on anyone in the follow up. But what we've learned by and large is that this commoditization of the Ecosystem service is not working in general. Uh, compensation is potential, that is the Costa Rica model, but co-investment and co-investment in 
the multifunctionality taken not only in terms of the multiple functions but the actual human relation between uh, beneficiaries and stakeholders is what is needed and we need a form of sharing that extends into the social domain. There's a lot of space for sharing in terms of there's still a lot of policies out there that are perverse, that are obstructing multifunctionality, there's a lot of policies that protect forests and make sure that farmers who grow trees are punished for growing those trees. This is an analysis for the Philippines with Fernando, a PhD student. Um, and we, we can show there that at the moment at farm gate prices, if you look at farmers who grow no tree at all versus farmers who grow a lot of trees, go in the transition or in between, in terms of profitability there is no gain at all in growing trees. In terms of return to labor, there's a, a tiny but negligible return. At the same time, if you do that same calculation at social prices, at national economic value, actually it would be a huge benefit even without talk about carbon for a Philippine society and those things are So there's a lot of what's behind it is um, discount rates and taxes on, on timber. And so there's a lot of space because we've been in that paradigm of agriculture should be here and the forest should be there, that we disallow the trees to come into the agriculture land. And we can remove those perverse policies and make huge gains. Yeah. Some recent literature on despairing versus sharing talks about the wildlife friendly farming. And of course, it, it's then mostly a matter of scale. Is this the Australia version actually different from this one? No, it's only a matter of in Australia, everything you measure in multiple kilometers, and in Costa Rica, you measure it in tens or hundreds of meters. But actually, this is just a blown up scale of this. So the debate of sharing versus sparing is partly artificial question of scale. Yeah, so my conclusion is that I see on the sparing hypothesis as it has been framed initially you see these two problems that agriculture intensification and forest both of them are very poorly defined and it's difficult to be empirical about it because we don't have proper definitions on it and we see a lot more space for a concept of sharing that looks at multifunctionality, takes it serious, allows the trees to come into the agriculture allows the carbon stock to come into the combined with agriculture productivity, not make a difference between forest and agriculture productivity, but look at the total value of land and the total values of that front. At the same time, it is not sparing versus sharing. Neither of them works without the caring. Yeah. And we will not save the natural forest without caring for the natural forest and doing specific actions to, to care of the natural forest, which is not happening in the current RDBD debate, because we're have an artificial agriculture forest divide out there. So we need a form of sharing that includes the social values and the biodiversity values and looks at true multifunctionality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya, and mm -hmm. thanks, Peter. So we have two um, <laughs> propositions up there, sparing versus sharing. Although I doubt that they are really seriously. Then it is now the then it is the sparing proponents. Personally, if I if I may uh, add a comment, it, it reminds me very much of what we have learned in, in our economics uh, uh, lectures long time ago of the uh, Japanese uh, uh, paradox, which says as you increase efficiency. Uh, on pro uh, pro productivity, your efficiency gains will be eaten up by increased consumption. Basically the same uh, phenomena which you have also described. Um, but let the audience ask you questions. Okay, so please. Yeah, maybe you want to... Yeah, I pretend that we disagree. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, but I'm not going to say
Okay, let's get it going. Yeah, please stand. Well, okay. yeah. Just to get things rolling, um, I, I was intrigued by what you mentioned about the nitrogen. You just uh, mentioned yeah, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, the way in which you um, noted it's nitrous oxide molecules at two and maybe times the mm -hmm. CO2, yeah. and that um, intensification that applies for nitrogen is going to mm -hmm. potentially have a greater um, yeah. effect on global warming and, mm -hmm. and deforestation. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, have you looked at that trade off between? Mm -hmm. Because remember, the original Borlaug hypothesis had nothing to do with carbon emissions. Yeah. It was all about just simply um, mm -hmm. saving or, or deforesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and what I think is coming through here, although just in passing, mm -hmm. is this other dimension of looking at the, the, the whole set of issues mm -hmm. in, in the context of carbon emissions per se. Yeah. There, your intensification, that is, yield increases, have other negative yeah. effects mm -hmm. yeah. that are not taken in. Because Borlaug was just simply land, you yeah. know, under production and land in yeah. forest. Yeah. Now we're looking at carbon emissions. So you yeah. have another set of variables. Have you actually um, looked at, or is there some of the literature looking at um, the issue of increased crop yields vis-a-vis -vis, um, the carbon emissions and the uh, mm -hmm. Not nitrous oxide emissions trade-off. Yeah. Well, we've done a bit. If you um, in, in the early ASB Indonesia report, uh, some of that. If we look at shifted cultivation, Sweden systems as something that has a crop phase and a fallow phase and intensification, and in that early sense means reducing the length of the fallow um, and getting more crops out and then accepting that your crop yield per hectare goes down. In the cropping years, the soil didn't reach the same level of fertility as it had before, but you get more crop, cropping years, so you get still a phase where reducing fellows would still increase total food production, even though yeah, if, if it, that part of the intensification would mean shortening the fellow period. And we can, from that work, see what would be the relation between the carbon stock in the landscape over such a cycle and food production, and see. Uh, in that relation, how fertilizer additions would come in. Yeah. Uh, and then, if we, the problem is, of course, that the specific N2O emission data are fairly weak. Uh, we have IPCC default values of 2% of the N fertilizer going off as N2O. Some people argue that it should probably be 5%, other people argue that it is 1%. And between 1 and 5% is actually where we see the difference on that argument. Yeah. So if 5% of the red fertilizer goes on the N2O, then the increased greenhouse gas effect of that emission would not be valid against the carbon emissions. If it is only 1%, then it, it, you can afford by the fertilizer used before it offsets the carbon. So that uncertainty that we have around N2O emission under tropical agriculture conditions is actually quite relevant for the details of this debate. But the equations are relatively simple to make if you uh, stay within a simple, simple description of, of fellow systems within mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I am very impressed by the argument, and uh, I want to ask about uh, the sparing dimension of the well, sparing tree intensification. Whether in your count, whether you actually took note of the Maybe socio-cultural realities of maybe some areas like some developing countries, Africa, that characterize land uses and agri practices there, uh, which uh, maybe could be advocate intensification, whether the idea could actually conform with what they practice or whether they could be maybe possibly uh, adapted into the system and how that would work. Mm. Because, uh, Honestly, uh, maybe I saw some maybe big challenges there. Mm -hmm. uh, and another dimension is that I, I, I was also worried about because of, I mean, the political economic perspective of it. And maybe look at it this way. You say you are sparing the forest and leave it. Uh, you don't you think the government can one way, so maybe one way or the other, take over the forest and make 
the use of it in a way that is even more destructive to the environment than maybe for agricultural purposes. I mean, it's, it's something that maybe when the argument came up, that's yeah. what yeah. yeah. okay. 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 You want me to just one that yeah. um, I think, yes, I think it's very relevant to think about context with within uh, intensification as far as the African context is concerned specifically, I mean, because the, the presumption is that it would be purely economic logic, you know, uh, and giving values to it, which is sometimes not the case for subsistence farmers within our own, our own context uh, in some cases. But I think one thing that is relevant in terms of context within this whole debate is the tenure, land tenure arrangements that go with whatever intensification dimension that you take, or even indeed the, the, the sharing, sharing dimension. Um, we need to really think about clearly this context, whether or not that works, because in some intensification contexts it doesn't work because people don't own the land and they cannot invest as much in the land because they are renting the land or things like that. Those kinds of things will definitely influence whether or not intensification is taken up or not. With respect to the second question that you asked, okay, that the assumption is that government will use the forest or not. I don't think that it presumes in any way it should in, in, in real life, in real situations, presume that the forest should only be left to be managed by government. We, we would expect to see a situation where the rules, in fact, in some places, the rules that, that restrict people from clearing the forest are community-based rules, yeah? That allow people to manage the forest in, the, you know, in their own way, in a more sustainable way than thinking that it will all be government-protected forest areas, which I guess in some contexts have not been been successful. So it doesn't presume that it should be left only in the hands of government. In fact, quite the contrary, it should be better if it were some consensual arrangement between government and communities to manage the forest that is left theoretically within within the, the, the sparing or sharing of the time. Yeah, I yeah, think. A clear example of what happens if you leave the forest with the government is Indonesia, where we then the forest department gets. We first we had logging, and then we had smaller trees going for plywood, and then we had the only smaller trees left, and we made pulp and paper out of it. And we had huge investment in pulp and paper industry, and now the whole forest management is geared towards keeping the pulp and paper factories happy and keeping them fed, and then this still called forest within the, the lines of salt. I think one element in that, I think probably would be very interesting to delve more into this Asia versus Africa comparison, is that it is not about agriculture and forestry, it is about the whole economy. Yeah? And in the Borlaug hypothesis, if uh, agriculture becomes less profitable because prices go down and the producers with poorer land decide to give up, what can we do? In Asia, they went to the cities and they found jobs in, in the industrialization that happened and we have the economic demographic transition that the majority becomes urban dependent on this and that. Mm. In Africa, that hasn't happened. Mm. Yeah. And if you don't get that demographic transition, if you don't get your industry developing, then uh, poorer farmers are poorer farmers, but they have no other choices than mm. making a poor farmer unless they can migrate to Europe, where places where the industry works, and there's no... Yeah, so. What's, what's missing in the equation is, is the rest of the economy and the industry, and that's, mm. that's the big difference between the graph that people showed between Asia and Africa. Mm. And it's not whether agriculture research did the job, yes or no, it is whether the rest of the economy was um, responding and, mm. and provide, making it possible. Mm. And we're way too constricted by the, the, the debating this between agriculture and forestry alone. Mm. Yes. Thank you very much for these two excellent presentations. Uh, of course, the saving forests is a very important objective, but I guess it's not the only objective. Uh, I have not heard much in these two presentations about people, 
So uh, if you compare these two approaches to management, uh, 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 is there any evidence from the field which one of these approaches is more beneficial in terms of uh, poverty reduction, in terms of increasing livelihood opportunities for people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, in that I would tend to go more with this argument about sharing and multifunctionality. Then I, I'll defend his point. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, yeah, I think I think more uh -huh. the more you look at more functions within the within mm -hmm. the the, the, the um, land use, I think the more you address the poverty situations. I mean, you can take the context of of. Um, um, Jambi, for example, where some of the um, plantations went completely economic in, 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 in a way, you know, then the people get subjected to, are more vulnerable to price fluctuations in, in commodities. Mm. Yeah, and that's exposure because they then may not have enough to look after other specific needs. So you find the experience where people have gone that direction, looking at one specific function in terms of making money from the land going into commodities, where they find difficulties when the prices are completely down in terms of meeting all the other needs. So you find contexts where they are now saying, look, we need to keep part of the land for food production so that we don't starve when the prices of commodities, you know, go down. So it's those kinds of things. So you've got to make sure that the land responds to multiple functions and keeps you safe with respect to different kinds of shocks that you might have. Yeah, there is, and, and that sort of the, the high level goals for the whole um, CGIR, the International Agriculture Research, and, and yeah, both on the ground here and FP has been a key player in that. It is still the goal is that prices of food go down. The goal is that the technical production needs go up to the level that prices go down, that the urban people have more food and that we have food security in that sense. What does it mean for the rural people? Well, the rural people have to, the, the island, they have to get out of urban areas and move to cities and become citizens that way. And that, agricult that level of agricultural research is not about getting people happier in the countryside, it is about uh, stimulating that transformation. And it is, I, I, I say it a bit harsher than it is normally said in that front, but it is, if we see intensification as this much broader concept of creating more value on land uh, and letting food production take care of itself, but, but intensifying through going to other higher value elements of it, that we see a very different agricultural research a very different paradigm of intensification taking place and yeah, that's one of the reasons that, that the overall goals for the international agriculture research agenda are still quite hotly debated between the different groups and, and what vision of development is, is there. It's not about agriculture research, it is about what, what vision of development is portrayed. Is there more than one option that, that we may need to pursue? And should we focus as much as we currently do on, on the state of food crops and making sure they can be produced more cheaply? Or should we focus on adding value to the landscape and, and making things more interesting for those people who are farming the land? And those lead to very different choices about what type of research we would want to do. I would like to return to the carbon Research on the carbon cycle of Chotofa and Western Africa. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's um, always so, um, if it's fair to apply this carbon argument to Africa. Mm -hmm. So you, you, they, the, the yields of uh, one hectare in Western Africa is really low, and the, um, mm -hmm. the possibility, the potential of intensification is um, really easy. You apply a little bit more of fertilizer. And you get more yield, so you have a big effect. Um, growing trees in the tree is nice in, in regard to, to the to the carbon carbon balance. But I'm wondering if this this argument should be applied in this case. And you said um, we shouldn't 
um, ask ourselves about the definition of forests, um, because everything contains carbon. But what, what happens when you apply another another indicator like biodiversity? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Well, um, I do care a lot about biodiversity, and, and because of that, I, I think I'm so keen on, on making sure the current debate on forest is not drawing the lines at, at, at the relevant position or having. Yeah, uh, we should. We thought what matters in the forest is much more the biodiversity than the carbon part, and, and, and trying to draw international policies on carbon lines is not going to lead to the objectives we have on biodiversity part in that sense. Um, there is high biodiversity carbon stock and there is low biodiversity medium carbon stock and this. So, uh, yeah, they are different. They are partly correlated. I see there is some convex curves possible, but they are definitely not the same. They are not fully correlated. Um, so should we apply, well, so our, our argument towards the forest debate, the uh, idea debate, is, is because there is no reason to have a separate policy for reducing emissions from deforestation, uh, we need to look at the whole carbon account and the whole land use, and if we want to make policies on emission reduction, then we have to measure emissions and emission reduction, and not uh, have one, one version that works for forest and the other one for other. We, we might have a version that works for high biodiversity landscapes and one for other, but forest is not, not currently doing that harm. In the biofuel debate, of course it is, yeah, the whole interest in, in Yatrofa is, is hardly been because it is a meaningful energy source. It, it was a way to circumvent the existing accounting rules and, and countries that import biofuels can meet their Kyoto obligations of emission reduction and not having to care about where the what emissions they're causing, and that's why we see the oil palm and other things potentially coming into it. It has hardly been a serious thing about actually energy sources, it has been um, yeah, skirting around the, the poorly defined policies that we've been seeing so far. And we see if we would do honest emission accounting, we would not see a lot of that get over hype having happened at all. Which doesn't mean that there isn't some local use of get over in some circumstances is possible, but the yeah, whole idea of using that as an export crop has been defrauded from the beginning. Um, question. I don't know if um, um, with this sparing and sharing theory or concept and meeting our target by uh, 2050 for the food um, like for the, you know, meeting this target, have you, for example, considered that this concept would somehow achieve the, those you know, mm -hmm. development goals? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we learned somewhere for PhD students. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think we have not, we have not thought about about our yeah, like meeting the, the food security with this target. Yeah. 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 No, I think the current, if the models, impact models, they have been still relatively simple. I mean, they have yeah, monoculture production systems fairly well accounted for. We don't have the multifunctional things currently in those models yet. So mm -hmm. there's still quite a lot of work. We're just starting between FP and Anycraft to get small model timber. We find it in a way that it could be taken into account, but that hasn't happened yet. So, so there's enough work to do for all of you. Maybe one more. Okay. Um, I would like to know in both of these uh, approaches, do you take into account the uh, discussion about carbon property rights? Um, the big question of the carbon belongs to who? Mm -hmm. in, this, in this case, if you deal with this uh, concept, um, what is your opinion about it, or how this works in, in the approach? Yes, I think it's it's an important question. Potentially, um, one of the biggest issues within the within the debate at the moment. Um, we obviously do some work on these things within the different countries that we work in. But there is very little evidence at the moment that any country that I know of 
has comprehensively addressed that specific dimension of carbon property rights. There are arrangements in different countries that sort of secure this in one way or another. I mean, for example, in Kenya, Wangari Mata had to secure a kind of arrangement with the government that any carbon that is generated from the trees that the women plant will become theirs, but it's not law, it's an agreement between her and government and things like that. There is a policy brief on, you know, rights and things on Indonesia. You know, I think the airman, you have copies yes. of that somewhere. So, yes, it is, it is important, but we are nowhere near a solution at the moment. Yeah, in, in most of the developing countries, you call land is, is heavily contested. <coughs> uh, and, and as much as carbon rights would refer back to land rights, that, that is a big a big issue. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, way too much of our current debate on either development or conservation is carbonized and, and we see things in carbon terms where what is the value of a cubic meter of wood? Well, low value wood is, is $100 per cubic meter and high value wood is $1,000 per cubic meter. And how much carbon is in there? Maybe $10 worth of carbon in there. So mm -hmm. we we make a lot of fuss about carbon value and who is the right to do that. And there's an awful lot more value in trees for current markets and current purposes that we haven't quite sorted out yet. Uh, so it should be about the rights to plant and manage and, and benefit from trees and then carbon will come on the back of that. And way too much at the moment is, is done as if carbon is the primary thing. And carbon should be the core benefit and social development and biodiversity should be the primary goals. And then so, but we, we have turned the world upside down by putting everything in carbon terms right now. Maybe allow me to ask a, one question as well. How, uh, how difficult is it for you to really persuade uh, uh, politicians about the, the sharing alternative, especially uh, in, in the context of other UN conventions like the one for biodiversity and mm -hmm. and the, um, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity where mm -hmm. uh, economists want to show that if we really take all values into account we come to a different come to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. I would expect that you get a lot of support from that side even from economists. Right? Even from economists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess within the climate debate this whole well, the, the way this rent debate went ahead and the way it developed, it seemed as if forests would move faster than other elements of the climate agreement. In the end, it, it isn't quite there yet, but maybe it will never get there at all. And we've been arguing for this realo, reducing emissions from any land use and, and, and a more holistic approach. I think gradually we see uh, more and more positive things about it, with more interest now in taking agriculture into the UNFCCC negotiations, but if it would have been on the whole end from the start, it might have been a lot further than that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment where we have this NAMA debate, this nationally appropriate mitigation action, the country of Indonesia is moving on that and, and, and doesn't care whether peat is a forest or so no, it cares about the emission reduction and it, it takes its priorities and how that's and, and, and not being bothered by forest versus agriculture option of a lot. So I think, yeah, the debate has, has been framed in those terms and we need to overcome that and we need to go to this more holistic pattern of it is about emissions in the global development context. I think that people can add on that. I, I think we see more and more people nodding that actually yeah, that is true and maybe it should be like that and, and maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, but current negotiating text is, is still there's forest here and there's agriculture there and there's nothing in between. Yeah, yeah I mean, partly also I think it's, it's the, the whole financial politics around, around it as well. I think that uh, many developing countries, apart from the few visionary ones, don't see the overall objective as the most important thing. They see the money what mechanisms will bring money to them now. And that means that it is a red mechanism, you know, in one way, because now they see 
not much money flowing into biodiversity, you know, per se. It's now all about carbon money. So people chase, chase the carbon money at the moment. Um, we hope that it will get to a point where this money will be in terms of the total ecosystem's value of a specific land use, and then they will chase the land use, which will then address the overall objective. But at the moment, everything is defined in terms of carbon because those units of carbon will eventually be reflected by X value in terms of economics. So it's still quite, quite uh, a slow process. But the countries that are further along in the thinking on red, even red as red, now begin to see how difficult it is to account for your, your, your red without looking at all the other things, sectors that contribute or indirectly impact on red somehow. So we're getting there, but it's very slow. It's much, much slower than we would have thought if we started from a more harmonized perspective. But this is the nature of, and the politics of environmental agriculture. So. Okay, maybe one last question. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about the um, assumption of calculating the footprint of all mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I think it does only consider the way the land, or I mean the land, and it does not consider the production or the potential production of the ocean. So isn't it possible that our actual footprint is still below the capacity of our Earth? And it's just a question, a technical question of the um, I don't know, approximating the optimum light efficiency in the global scale. Yeah, the indicated yes, that yeah, show is from the footprint work that WWF has been involved with. And, and the, the total footprint comes from food production plus firewood plus uh, fiber and paper use plus what is assumed to be necessary to absorb the carbon that we have emit. You can say, of course, the world has plenty of land, but at the same time, we see an increase of the greenhouse gas emissions, which shows that that function is not being taken care of. But the need, the way that assumption is made about the, how much land would be needed to absorb the CO2 that is emitted for the industrial part of the world is debatable, or, or it is like a weak, I would say. Yeah, but overall, the argument that we're not currently making that is that uh, yeah, we see the atmospheric concentration of CO2 going up and, and, and the fact that the footprint is met is, is the spillover is at the moment in the atmosphere is not yeah, so but yeah uh, the, the assumptions made at the specific level of what how much area would be needed to absorb carbon is, is by far the weakest of that whole calculation. I guess it's good to delve into the details on that. I think it's uh, my point was not about the sequestration of carbon, but about the productivity of the Yeah, it, it, it does take into account, and, and similarly, that work that Peter did from the, let's say, the, the, the leakage part. So those countries that have increased their forest area, or reported forest area, uh, half the, they have at the same time increased their import of food and fiber from other countries, China being a, a key example, and of course Japan and I mean, earlier on that front, and Vietnam is on that line. So those countries that have protected their forest in peace, forest area, have at the same time increased their external footprint mm -hmm. with 50% of the area that they now claim to be forest within them. And that is based on FAO statistics of, let's say, from which countries they report, and what is the average per hectare productivity in the country from which they import and combining those data. Uh, so all these FAO data, of course, have have their own weaknesses, but it is trying to do as good a job as we, we can currently do. I think the, 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 there is quite some arable land data, there is quite some uh, livestock data. What I'm not aware of is whether, you know, inland fisheries is, is, is included in that kind of calculation. But I, I do think that the fish productivity is, is, is mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure whether it is factored in, into the land or not, mm -hmm. because you are referring to oceans, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that is. Once I'm, I'm aware of in terms of land versus productivity, I think I've seen more land, uh, more arable land, livestock land needs rather than than um, oceanic productivity data. I'm not. I don't know if you've seen that, but but looking at land and productivity, I've not seen anything to do with that. And in fact, I haven't really seen anything about estimating how much land in terms of uh, uh, fish production, you know, is, is really included in the land data. I haven't seen that. So, so not oceanic no, productivity. I haven't seen that. Sure, because that was question of the yeah. capacity of the Earth is one, and now we are at I don't know 1.8. It's just a question of time until the system will crash. But the question is, uh, should we be scared or not? Mm. It's just yeah. a question of taking the food and taking the dirt. I mean, the water is a solar constant, and yes, mm. mm. try to impose it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. yeah. The yeah. footprint data that is showed here is from a couple of years ago. I think the more recent one, which is even more dramatic, the overshoot. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think those things have their own uh, public relations yeah. value, communications <laughs> value, the scientific basis mm -hmm. is certainly debatable. Yeah, but one on the one on 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 uh, land overshooting, yeah. 2020 to 2050 is 2011. Yeah. So that's quite yeah. uh, quite recent. Okay, thank you very much, Peter and Meine, for sharing your thoughts with us instead of staring us from it. <laughs> thank you very much for the audience to come and discuss with us. And I hope to have you back not too late again. Okay. <laughs>